practice listening test for IELTS. Version 5. Instructions. You will hear a number of different recordings and you will have to answer questions on what you hear. There will be time for you to read the instructions and questions and you will have a chance to check your work. All the recordings will be played only once. The test is in four sections. Write all your answers in the listening question booklet. At the end of the test, you will be given 10 minutes to transfer your answers to an answer sheet. Now turn to section 1. Section 1. You are going to hear a conversation between a student and an academic advisor. Look at questions 1 to 13. Now listen to the conversation and answer questions 1 to 13. Jane Zhang has an appointment with an academic advisor to discuss her plans for studying in Canada. Hello there, you must be Jane. Please come in. My name is Mrs Dunstan. Hello Mrs Dunstan. Pleased to meet you. All right now, let's see. Now, you're interested in attending university in Canada, is that right? Yes. And I have a lot of questions to ask you. OK, but before I begin to answer your questions, I need to ask you a few questions first. Now, your major is... Engineering. Mechanical engineering. Right. And where did you graduate? I graduated from the Beijing Institute of Machinery in July 1998. I completed my bachelor's degree. OK. Now, I'm assuming you want to continue studying in that field. Am I right? Actually, I'd prefer to do an MBA if possible. But if I have no other choice, then I'll continue in mechanical engineering. OK. Now, are you familiar with the requirements for an MBA degree? Yes. I think I need to do well on the GMAT, and I'll definitely need the TOEFL or IELTS, right? That's right. You'll need at least 600 on the TOEFL, or 6.5 on IELTS. In addition, you need to have completed a bachelor's degree, too. Did you take the GMAT yet? No, but I plan to take it in August. The requirements for a master's degree in engineering are a little different. You'll need to take the GRE and, of course, the TOEFL or IELTS. I see. And when do I start to apply? The best time to start the application process is in November or December of the year prior to your intended year of study. Application forms are usually available in September or October. Which schools in Canada offer the MBA degree? Of the approximately 50 universities in Canada, 20 offer an MBA. Here's a small booklet summarising Canadian university programmes. You'll find all the information on page 22. Great. Thanks. And how about tuition and scholarships? Tuition for MBA programmes has been steadily increasing. Some universities now charge the full tuition meaning that there is no government subsidy. Those universities cost about $10,000 per year, and it's a two-year program. Other universities are still government subsidized, so the tuition is only about $4,500 per year. In terms of scholarships, usually the top five students entering the MBA program are given a generous scholarship. All other students have to pay the full fees, International students have to pay the full tuition. That's $10,000 per year. Oh. Is it very difficult to get into an MBA programme? Yes. In fact, the competition is very strong. MBA graduates have a pretty easy time finding a job, so many students are eager to do the programme thinking it will guarantee them success in their careers. Well, it sure does sound like an excellent way to start a promising future. Um... What is the school year like? Classes begin in September each year and finish before Christmas. They resume after New Year and finish at the end of April. And after April? Why, that's your summer holiday. Sounds great. I want to thank you, Mrs Dustin, for all your help. I really do appreciate it.
You're very welcome. And if you have any other questions, please feel free to contact me. You know my number, right? I sure do. Thanks very much. Goodbye. That is the end of section one. You will have half a minute to check your answers. Now turn to section two. Section two. Jane wants to know more about Canada, so she attends a lecture about Canada's education system. Read the statements and indicate whether the following statements are true or false by writing T for true and F for false. Look at questions 18 to 22. Now listen to the lecture and answer questions 18 to 22. Good morning. Today I'd like to continue our series, Talks About Canada. This morning I will talk about Canada's education system. In Canada, students have many opportunities for education. Canadian children start attending kindergarten at age 5. From ages 6 to 12, Children study in grades 1 to 6 at elementary school. When students are approximately 13 and 14 years old, they attend grades 7 and 8 in junior high school. And from age 15 to 18 or 19, they go to high school, starting with grade 9 and ending with grade 12. The Canadian government provides free public education for all students aged 5 to 18 or 19, or from kindergarten the grade 12. All children must attend school until they are at least 16 years old. From kindergarten to grade 12, the school year begins in early June. The school year for college students starts in early September and ends in May. For university students, classes begin in mid-September and end at the end of April. All students have two weeks of holidays during Christmas and New Year as well as one week of holiday in February or March. The Canadian education system aims to be student-centred, that is, it focuses primarily on the needs of the students and strives to meet those needs. In addition, some of the important goals of education include teaching children to be creative, to use critical thinking skills when solving problems, and to work both independently as well as in a team. Honesty and integrity are also highly valued in Canadian education and offenders face very serious consequences. The classroom is an active place. Students are encouraged and expected to participate in class discussions and activities. The teacher plans his or her lessons so that each student can learn. This sometimes requires much adaptation in teaching methodology as the teacher endeavours to, to teach students in the way they learn best. From kindergarten to grade 6, students follow the same basic curriculum. Starting in grade 7, students must study a common curriculum, but they have the portion of choosing a few, various elective courses, according to their likes and interests. In high school, about 60% of the curriculum are mandatory which means that all students must take the same courses. This also means that students are given the freedom to choose 40% of their courses. The courses chosen by each student will vary greatly and will depend on the student's intended career goals. After completing high school, many students will continue their education at college or university. This is called post-secondary education and 
Although it's subsidized by the Canadian government, students must pay tuition fees. There is no national entrance examination for college and university admission. Students are admitted to college or university based on their high school grades. Canadian students have many chances to enter university, even if they don't do well in their high school studies. For example, a student who does not finish grade 12 can still be admitted to university as a mature student when they are at least 23 years old or older. And a student whose high school grades are too low for university can first attend college and then apply later on for university entrance. In Canada, colleges are very different academic institutions than universities. At college, students take job-related courses they receive a diploma after two or three years of study, and they learn very practical skills. At university, students take a broad range of courses. They receive a bachelor's degree after four years of study, and they learn theoretical knowledge and new ways of thinking. Canada's focus on student-centred education means that students can change their major as well as transfer to a different college or university if they want to. In fact, it is pretty much expected that most students will change their major at least once during their post-secondary education. That's the end of section two. Now you will have half a minute to check your answers. Now turn to section three. Section three. You will hear a job interview. As you listen to the interview after questions 23 to 30. First look at questions 23 to 30. Now listen to the interview and answer questions 23 to 30. Good morning, my name is Susan Smith. I'm a personal manager. You're Tom Swain from England, is that right? Yes, I saw the advertisement about the job in yesterday's newspaper. Well, Mr Swain, I'd like to talk about your personality. You know, the right personality is essential for the job and we'll give you some psychological tests later on. Perhaps you would like to tell me a little about yourself. Certainly. What would you like to know? Well, you know, human relations are going to be particularly important in this job. Tell me, do you get on well with people? Very well indeed. I'm never short of friends. Good. Sometimes, though, you may have to be very tough. For example, you may have to sack someone. Would you say that you're capable of being really hard? If something has to be done... I'll do it. You studied management sciences in the UK, didn't you? By the way, what type of degree did you get? A first class. And then you did a master's degree in America. Tell me, what was the title of your thesis? My thesis? Organisational Factors in Successful Exporting. Tell me, how many foreign languages do you speak? Three. French, Spanish and some Arabic. Oh, I've started learning Japanese. You'll have to work abroad a lot, and that can be very frustrating sometimes. Would you say that you're a patient person? Yes, and I would say that I'm a very patient person. I've never seen the point in losing one's temper. It's very good. Can you keep a secret? A lot of the information you'll be dealing with will be classified. It will be quite safe with me. And then you'll have a lot of reports to write. Often under pressure, do you think you can write for a deadline? I usually get things finished on time. The pressure often helps. Oh, and um, have you got a good memory? That's essential. I'm very good at remembering names and conversations, and I'm fairly good 
at facts and figures, but I can't remember places. Do you? That is the end of section three. You will now have half a minute to check your answers. Now turn to section four. Section four. You are going to listen to a lecture about animals. Look at questions thirty-one to forty-two. Now listen to the lecture and answer questions 31 to 42. In our world of living things, we have plants, animals, and people. Plants belong to a group called the plant kingdom, while animals and people belong to the animal kingdom. Look around you, and you will see many different types of animals. Some animals are tiny, while others are very large. Some animals are soft and long, while others are hard and rounded. Different types of animals, which are alike in certain ways, are put into groups. Let us find out how animals are put into groups. We can put animals into groups by studying their behaviour. We want to know how their bodies work, how they live, how they produce their young, how they find their food, what they eat, how long they live, and so on. We also have to examine the different parts of their bodies. When we examine them, here are a few questions we must ask ourselves: Do they have scales, feathers, or fur on their bodies? How many legs do they have? How many wings are there? Are there fins? But the first and most important question is: Do the animals have backbones or not? All animals with backbones are put into one big group called vertebrates. All animals without backbones go into another group called invertebrates. Invertebrates are animals which do not have backbones or other bones inside their bodies. Some have soft bodies and some have hard coverings which protect their bodies. Vertebrates are animals with backbones and bones inside their bodies. The bones help to support their bodies. There are five main groups of vertebrates. The fish, the amphibians, the reptiles, the birds, and the mammals. Fish, amphibians, and reptiles are known as cold-blooded vertebrates. The blood of a warm-blooded vertebrate remains around the same temperature both on warm and cold days. Fish live in water and have fins which help them to swim. The body of a fish is made up of the head, the trunk, and the tail. The tail ends in a tail fin. There are many different kinds of fish, and they are of many different shapes and colors. Some fish are long and thin, while others are flat and rounded. Most fish have bodies which are broad at the trunk region and narrow towards the head and tail. Frogs, toads, newts, and salamanders are amphibians. All amphibians have thin skins which are usually wet and slimy. They have two pairs of legs. The toes of most amphibians have webs of skin between them. This allows them to swim well in water. The body of a frog or a toad is made up of two parts: head and the trunk. There is no neck or tail. Adult newts and salamanders have tails. Frogs and toads are important to human beings as they feed on insects. Some of these insects may be harmful to us. Toads produce poison from the skin for protection. Wash your hands after touching a toad. Reptiles live mainly on land, but some live in water. They breathe through lungs and have dry, scaly skins. Reptiles, which live in water, come to the water surface to breathe. 
Reptiles lay eggs with hard shells. Lizards, snakes, and tortoises are reptiles which live mainly on land, while crocodiles, alligators, and turtles live in water. The body of a reptile, such as the crocodile and lizard, is made up of the head, the trunk, and the tail. Most reptiles do not have necks. Many reptiles have four legs with toes. Turtles and tortoises have hard shells which protect their bodies. Snakes are different from the other reptiles because their bodies are very long and they have no legs. They move by gliding along the ground. Some snakes can also swim. Birds are animals with feathers on their bodies. They have many different types of feathers. Some are small and fluffy, and others are long and flat. Feathers come in many different colors. Birds have no front legs, but instead they have a pair of wings. They use their wings to fly, but some birds have wings, such as penguins and emus, as small and stubby. These birds cannot fly. The body of a bird is made up of a head, a neck, a trunk, and a tail. The mouth of a bird is in the form of a hard bill or beak. The shape of the bill depends on the type of food the bird eats. Some birds, such as ducks, have flat bills for sieving small bits of food from the mud. Other birds, such as eagles, have sharp, pointed bills for catching small animals and tearing fish. Birds which search for frogs and worms in the mud, such as storks and flamingos, have long, pointed bills. Most mammals live on land, but some, such as whales and dolphins, live in water. Some mammals, such as bats, have wings and can fly. Other mammals, such as moles and rabbits, burrow into the ground and live there. Mammals have hair on their bodies. Bears and dogs have very thick hair, which is called fur. Human beings have little hair on most parts of their bodies, but a lot on their heads. All mammals breathe through lungs. Even those which live in water have to come to the surface of the water to breathe. The young mammals grow in the bodies of their mothers. When they are old enough, they come out of their mothers' bodies. When they come out, they are said to be born. The mother takes care of her newborn baby and feeds it with milk, which is formed in her body. When the baby is older, he takes care of himself. That's the end of section four. You now have half a minute to check your answers.